Hi, everybody, and welcome. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us today for an exciting series of presentations. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Jim Rome, and I'm a product manager here at CR on the Consumer Products team. Today, we're excited to showcase the final presentations and demos of a prototyping challenge that six different university teams have worked on through a collaboration with the NYC Media Lab. I'll let our partners over there give a brief intro about their organization in a minute. But from the CR side, we worked very closely alongside the digital lab team, specifically with Ben Moskowitz and Bill Fitzgerald, to craft a challenge for students that explores the future of consumer and digital privacy rights. The key theme was around the fact that consumers want to be able to control their personal data, including how it's used and how it's shared. And the project mission statement was that we strongly believe a person shouldn't need a, legal de a law degree or be willing to spend multiple hours reading dense legalese in order to understand the privacy implications of installing an app on your phone or just even being active online. We want data privacy policies to be clear and concise to collect and retain only the minimal data necessary. So that's the quick summary about the challenge and why we're here. And now I'd like to hand it over to our partners, Steven Rosenbaum and Erica Matsumoto from the Media Lab. Thank you so much, Jim. We are so excited to be here today. And um, to begin, we'd like to have some opening remarks with Steve Rosenbaum, who will talk about the NYC Media Lab. I'm going to start a screen share. Give me one second. Okay. Can everyone see the screen? Yes. All right. Steve, take it away. So I would just like to start by saying, you know, when we got into this, there was this question about whether or not data and da data privacy was sexy. And, and I have to say, I'm super excited about what we're going to see today. But I also think that this topic is incredibly timely and relevant and important. And with that, I'll tell you just a little bit about the Media Lab and what it does. Uh, the NYC Media Lab is first and foremost, uh, has a mission to connect, collaborate and innovate. And we're a consortium of New York City universities with a drive to innovate entrepreneurship and talent development. The universities are NYU, Columbia, the City uh, University of New York, CUNY, the New School, Pratt, SBA and Manhattan College. And we're supported by NYC EDC and the City of New York Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. We're also an extraordinary collection of corporate members, some of whom you will see on the screen and recognize immediately. And Consumer Reports is a new member. This is our first project together. And, and you know, when you get into new relationships, it's, it starts with the first date and you hope it goes well. And I just have to say, we've been so incredibly impressed with the quality of the thinking and the partnership and the commitment to this, uh, this program uh, over the last couple of months. So, so the, the Media Lab does three things extraordinarily well. We do corporate innovation work, which is prototyping, applied R&D. Then we have our venture platform, which is the, the combine. And then last but not least, we do executive education with working groups, events, and publications. And together, we really look to see the future, build the future. And we count on student groups like the ones that you're going to see today to really be able to help us map where the world is going and some possibilities. So with that, uh, very, very excited to, to introduce my colleague, Erica Matsumoto, who has been leading this extraordinary challenge together. And she'll talk specifically about the data, consumer data privacy prototyping project. Erica, Thanks, take Steve. it away. Thanks, Steve, and hi, everyone. We are so excited to be here and showcase the six amazing projects uh, from our university community uh, today. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to start with a quick thank you uh, to Jim, Bill, Ted, and Ben, who have been really integral throughout this program. Um, and before we get started, we wanted to give um, the attendees a quick overview on the challenge itself. So what we wanted to do was really elevate and raise awareness around consumer data and privacy. And we opened up a challenge with the following guiding questions. I'm not gonna read them verbatim, but as you can see, they really focused on raising awareness amongst everyday users of technology. Um, and this is a really broad mandate 
Um, and we came, we received, you know, dozens of really fascinating approaches to tackle these questions. Um, and we selected the following teams that you'll hear from today. And so um, we have a team that's focusing on applications of using computer vision, um, identifying ways to identify a compliance, um, delving into the product's code, as well as tools that identify and surface opaque network connections. We really see this as, the, as one category of addressing um, and raising awareness around oftentimes um, opaque policies and technologies that are coded into hardware and software in ways that we are not aware of. The second category of teams that we selected really focus on raising awareness amongst um, everyday users in really fun, interactive ways. So you'll see games, you'll see chatbots, you'll see new ways to sort of raise awareness amongst demographics that oftentimes need to know about these policies and are often most impacted by these policies. But, you know, terms and conditions are so complicated. Um, these, these projects really aim to reduce that um, barriers to, to awareness. So with that, um, what we're going to do is kick off and um, introduce the first team. We're gonna have each team present and after each team presentation, we welcome all of you to use the chat feature that you'll see um, on the bottom part of your screen. You can also raise your hand and we'll do an open Q and A and feedback session after every team. Um, all right, and with that, I'm gonna stop my screen share and take a moment to introduce the entire cohort. So cohort, if we can just open up our videos, say hello. Um, we actually ran this program entirely virtually, so none of us have met each other, but I feel like we all have gotten to know each other rather well. Um, so with that, let's kick it off to, with uh, Team Bam Bam. Hello everyone. Uh, I'll just quickly share my screen. Uh, please let me know once it's up. We see it. Yes, see it, and it's changing. Not yet. Okay, cool, awesome. Uh, well, uh, I'll can get started then. Uh, Hello everyone, uh, very good morning to all of you and congratulations for making it to the last month of a very interesting year. We are team Bam Bam, which stands for Brent, Arnav, that's me, and Matthew, and we are here today to present our project that we've been working on over the past 10 weeks. We are drowning in an ocean of internet enabled devices. They have been growing exponentially and by 2030, by some projections, we'll have 24 billion of them around us. And the problem is IoT devices collect as much, if not more of your data than standalone apps or websites. But, but while there are available tools for analyzing these privacy policies and terms of services, there doesn't exist anything similar for IoT devices because unfortunately you can't install a Chrome extension in real life yet. And as these insecure devices and terrible data gathering practices have real world consequences, whether it's like turning your smart home into a botnet for Bitcoin or hacking your Nest camera to threaten kidnapping for your baby. So what we set out to do was make an app with which you could point your phone camera at an IoT device and get a simple and clear explanation of its data collection and security practices. And this is what we came up with. And now let us walk through the process of how we achieved it. We began our project by looking at initiatives that have tried to address these problems previously. And these were some of the examples that we were inspired by. And we leveraged previous ethnographic studies to define two target personas, lazy experts and amateurs, people who don't care, who care about security, but don't want to read a privacy policy 
or are looking for an educational tool to educate others about the extent of IoT's data gathering. From our personas, we iterated upon the user flows to create the app. The first flow is where the user can open the app and scan their surroundings to detect internet-enabled devices. And then the app gives the user bite-sized information about the data and the security hygiene of the app that's easy to understand. To create the privacy visualization, we leaned upon the digital standard and the real-time information gathered by Thingscope, which is a project from our current cohort that you shall hear more from soon. And once we had done this, we also created another flow where in the case that the object is not recognized, user have the option to upload photos of the device so that it can be added to the image recognition pipeline. And once we had worked out the user flow, it was time to build it. And ex to explain that part of the process, I should hand it over to Brent. Hey everybody. So our technical framework has two major parts. We have an iPhone app that allows the users to point their camera at a device and display its information and an image classifier model that's trained to identify different smart speakers. We chose smart speakers because we have them at home to test on, but don't worry, Wikibar is unplugged. Um, so to make that last statement clear, an image classifier is a machine learning model that's designed to take an image of one thing and figure out what it is. The same way your iPhone's face ID looks at a face and decides whether or not it's yours. I'm emphasizing one thing because these models aren't designed to find multiple things in an image. They get confused on images like the one on the right with both a Google Home and an Alexa. Uh, next slide. So the process for training this model started with set, getting several thousand images of smart devices and hand labeling them. We spent a very long time doing what you see in the GIF here. So once those images were labeled, we put them into an image classification algorithm, which then learned to identify the smart devices from our labels. So this is where we are now with our prototype. We have a system where we build a data set, feed it into the model, and then put it into an app that can detect the devices from your camera feed and give you their information. Uh, next slide. And getting this far has already resulted in some promising outcomes. We're excited about the potential for others to use the things we've already built. This infrastructure could be useful for artists, security enthusiasts, or just curious technologists. Uh, but we wanna take this a lot further. Right now, our app can identify Amazon and Google smart speakers, but we'd like it to identify dozens or even hundreds of devices. And we want it to do more than just point at one smart device at a time and tell you what it is. We want our users to be able to find any smart device just by panning their camera around a room. Right now, the app uses an image classifier, which, as I said, can identify one thing at a time, but it can't find every device in your kitchen or your living room just from one image. So that's where object detection comes in. It's a machine learning method that can find multiple objects in a single image, allowing users to find every smart device their phone camera sees, not just one at a time. We've already started working on an object detection model, which you can see in the GIF on the right. While it's still in the early stages, our initial test results have actually been very strong. Uh, next slide. So to move forward with this, we have two challenges. First, Working with machine learning on a consumer level scale is technically complex and very compute heavy. Ensuring we have the resources and infrastructure we need will be key. Second, to be able to identify more devices, we need more data, thousands of images that have to be labeled manually. This is our biggest challenge and it'll take a lot of work. Uh, next slide. So that's why we think Consumer Reports is such a good fit for this project. A company that has access to a wide range of these devices and tests them thoroughly can provide us the resources and information to get a data set of the size and quality that we need. And after that data set is built, by allowing users to upload photos of devices the model doesn't recognize, we can keep improving the model automatically. User-generated images will teach it about new devices without us lifting a finger and provide a pipeline for finding new smart devices that might not be on Consumer Reports radar. So with the resources and time to build this project out to its potential, we think we can empower users to know exactly what smart devices are around them and what they're doing with their data anytime and anywhere. Thank you. All right, great job. Thank you, Team Bam Bam. Let's open it up to uh, feedback and questions from the audience. So um, folks in the, uh, who are watching the, the webinar feature, please feel free to use the chat feature below. Um, you'll see it, uh, you should see a little icon with a, with a talk bubble. Uh, please feel free to ask any thoughts or questions there. Um, 
All right, Jim, let's start off this, uh, this Q&A portion. What were your thoughts on uh, Team Bam Bam? Yeah, so guys, that was great, super exciting. I guess I'd love to learn a little bit more about, so you manually had to classify all the images. So was that literally taking different images scraped off the internet? Like where did you get the-, the uh, Yeah, classes? so we started by scraping a lot of images and then we also used image data that we generated ourselves of our own speakers. But yeah, so this is like the big challenge in any machine learning project is just getting and labeling the data. Got it, thanks, makes sense. Hey, it's Ben here. I just wanted to say, um, I, I really like the idea of, as part of CR's testing process, you know, creating a new and proprietary set of training images. I think that, that is a really clever way of kind of piggybacking on what we already do. Uh, and if we had data about what the network traffic for a given device looks like, assuming you had the app running on your own network, you could combine both the visual identification that you've demonstrated. And I think where you were going with that is also potentially some of what ThingScope is working on. So I love the synergy there and I love how you thought about how this could piggyback on what we already do at CR. Yeah, I think there's a lot of synergy between us. And yeah, you guys in the audience will hear a lot more about ThingScope later, but sort of combining CR's existing pipelines and what we and ThingScope are doing, I think could have a really uh, broad coverage of security. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm seeing a hand raised. Oh, that's you, Ben. Hi, Ben. <laughs> Uh, great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, other attendees, please feel free to, yeah, uh, share any thoughts, questions, feedback. Um, thank you, Ted. And Eric, I'll just jump in and say, so everything, as you probably saw for the audience, this is being recorded. We'll send out, um, you know, all the, uh, the videos afterwards, and we can always follow up if there's additional questions beyond um, this, this specific presentation, we can always follow up afterwards. Sounds good. We're also going to share a lot of this content on um, NYC Media Lab social channels too. So like um, Jim mentioned, we'll create little bite-sized videos. All right, let's jump into our next team. Thank you, Team Bam Bam. We'll take a moment and um, Thanks, congratulate. Everybody. Great work. Thank um, you. Let's, let's jump into uh, Team Jeopardies. All right. Just a minute, share computer sound, and share. We see All right. Mm -hmm. Hey, um, does everyone see the note as well? We do, we see your notes. <laughs> you might want to do full right. screen, yeah. Okay, in that case, just a minute, how do I do this then? Yeah, there you go, present mode. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, all right, so should I start? Yes. Cool. Um, hi, um, good morning, and thank you for being here today. We are Team Jeopardies, um, a, group of, um, a group of designers and technologists from Parsons Design and Technology Program. Um, from left, we are Jill, Pranjal, Rosie, Dae Young, and Sven. And today we will present, you, uh, we will present to you our project, Termed. Termed is an interactive game platform for eight to 12 year old children, um, which will propel them to understand, the, understand concepts of data, privacy and consent and choose healthier online practices. A little bit of fact check. Um, at the moment, 92% of children in the US gain online presence before turning two and 45% uh, of 10 to 12 year old, uh, years old um, have social media profile. Um, that, and these stats um, lead to the fact of ad advertisement technology companies holding 72 million data points on a, a child by the time they turn 13. And not only so, 56% of eight to 12 year, um, eight to 12 year olds wa watch online videos every day. Meanwhile, YouTube has over 5 million GDPR violation on data collection of minors. And this has, um, these stats and fa facts has led to one very contemporary um, 
phenomenon, which is digital presence of children keeps increasing every single day, but at the same time, not enough is being done to safeguard their online privacy. So our vision is to create, uh, and what was that? Um, sorry. Um, no, 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 no. So our project aims to, um, our, pro our project, <clears throat> sorry, our project aims to um, gamify this process of um, learning about data and data security and consent. And through that, we are trying to make a more, um, trying to make this learning experience more fun. And here is our term, uh, game for data well-being. Jill. So um, the game essentially consists of three components. The first one are the tasks, which answer the question of what do we do online? Like what kids normally do online? Then the next component are the choices, which attempt to show how the, show the ways in which these tasks can be performed. So basically answering the question of how it can be done. And then the power, uh, those components elevate the ideas and tools for data safety by answering what more can be done. Uh, we're quickly going to show this demo uh, of how the game is being played. Tasks were added in order to capture what kids do on the internet, keeping in mind the familiarity and frequency of performing those tasks in real life. So um, if you take on to the next slide. We divided our task predominantly into these four categories based on what kids end up doing. And these were derived from research and studies. Uh, we have a category of online searching, so like searching for keywords and searching for things and toys on the internet. And a lot of them spend a lot of time playing games and downloading games and in-app applications from the app store. So that was one other category for tasks. And then there was social media based on the stats that we got. But a lot of kids do have an account in social media and they end up sent, spending a lot of their data, like posting friends and posting, uh, tagging people and tagging their location and things like that. And then there's the media and entertainment uh, category because a lot of kids do end up watching videos online and keep downloading um, songs and cartoons and poems and stuff like that. Um, the next component that the major component of the game are the choices. They're meant to capture the multiple ways in which one single task can be completed. And the choice that, you, that the player makes has a direct impact on the data health score. The safer the option you select, the lesser the loss of data point. So the example that you see on the screen up here, like for picture posting, if you select the option where you tag both the people and the location on the picture, you lose out on the maximum data health points. Next slide. And power cards, essentially one of the most important components of like all three of them are important of our game. Uh, these cards represent the extra mile that one can go to protect their data. Uh, essentially teaching kids about resources they have like VPNs or selective consent or switching off their GPS, which is constantly on on the mobile phones in order to save their data from being spent. Um, these power cards would essentially just tell kids that these me measures are accessible to you. You can use them on a day-to-day -day basis and protect your data. For the visual look and feels of, of the game, we chose 8-bit graphics and a color scheme that would be most attractive to kids. The game is predominantly text-based since we also wanted the kids to get into this habit of reading data policies, measures, and privacy regulations because it is the whole real-life end of it is also text-based. Next. And finally, last but not the least, the next steps uh, that we have given unlimited time and resources 
is to develop an interactive uh, web prototype which people can um, test out and kids can play them so that we can take that user feedback and implement that feedback into our gaming design and presentation elements. And finally, we want to um, dive into outreach and distribution for the web game so that this is available and accessible to most kids and schools and parents and kids can actually gain from this game. But thank you, this is it. Great job, thank you so much, Team Jeopardy. Super fascinating, um, really cool to see how your um, game components have evolved as well. Um, and I really enjoyed how you set up some of the stats to, you know, the landscape and the, and the, the problems you're looking to, to address here. So now let's open it up to feedback Q&A. Um, folks, please feel free to use uh, the chat feature here. Um, all right, we've got a couple questions. Uh, Anoop. Did you take into account measuring COPA violations? Uh, would the parent consent not be compulsory for every privacy related action due to COPA regulations? So I assume Anoop, you're probably talking about the, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, right? So, um, so yeah, we're talking about the, the legal aspects of uh, yeah. having kids, I believe that's ages 12 and above, I think is-, is No, uh, we were targeting the age group of eight to 12 year olds. I think, yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Yep, mm -hmm. yeah, I think, uh, go for it, Jill. Yeah, sorry, uh, okay. Uh, so uh, yes, we, we have been reading a lot, a lot on the COPA violations and all the stats that we gathered were actually coming from there, like especially around, there have been a lot of controversies around YouTube and Google using and violating a lot of those data points. And that has been something which is constantly in our minds. So uh, the idea of uh, like, uh, the next question is like, would parent consent not be compulsory? Uh, yes, it is compulsory, but at times, like I've, I've seen it in my own family that it's just, the kids are crying on the table. They just need the phone and parents are so frustrated with all that noise. They end up giving all sorts of um, uh, consents, which they should not, but they do it just because it's, it's very real. It's their household and they cannot stop their kids from crying. So that's a major, uh, major issue. So we thought that maybe giving kids the agency to do something for themselves might be a step forward if they start learning about data from a young age. It's almost like um, you're taught about good touch and bad touch from a very early age. And teaching kids about data is as important as that in the current economy and the culture that we are finding ourselves in. That's a great point and a great um, comparison and allegory. All right, seeing some great feedback here. Great storytelling. Um, I think we have a Parsons alum as well in, in the crowd. So hello. Um, someone has asked about age group adaptation. So is your team looking to adapt the game to address perhaps uh, branch out into additional age groups? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing that, um, Alberto, if that is not correct, feel free to chime in on uh, the chat. For the first phase, we are targeting uh, the age group of eight to 12, um, but we might think about um, doing this even for kids younger than that, since a lot of the stats are telling us that uh, kids below two have their online presences and stuff, but it's just that we don't know yet what kind of logistics that would involve. So right now we're gonna be sticking to kids between eight to 12. We started with this uh, age group because we wanted it to be like narrow enough uh, because at this age kids are like growing tremendously and their behavior changes a lot so we didn't want like any broad age group we wanted like a very narrow one to start with uh, but uh, like seven to eight years old kids are very different from 10 to 11 year old kids so we are like uh, going forward with this for now but we'll definitely think of uh, changing the game for like different age variations Great, thank you so much. All right, I think we're at time. Uh, so we'll move on to the next team. Thank you very much, Team Jeopardy. So let's move on to Team Mitigator. Mitty, take it away. We see your screen. Don't forget to unmute.
There we go. <laughs> yep, we hear you. Awesome. Hello, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Mithi, and uh, today I'll be presenting our project uh, mitigator that I've worked on with uh, Professor Ian Goldberg from the University of Waterloo. So we all know about how privacy policies are really hard to read. And on the other hand, uh, users have no way of knowing whether the company collects and processes its data in compliance with the privacy policy. So for example, earlier in the summer, Zoom's privacy policy did not reflect its sharing practices. Zoom was found to be sending users location data and uh, device identifi identifiers to Facebook uh, when the privacy policy did not uh, mention this uh, sharing behavior. So no more uh, will you need to say, you know, well, we don't really know if the website's doing this bad thing with our data. Uh, uh, Mitigator will check the code and verify it uh, that you can't see. And uh, we will tell you if it, that code is being compliant with the website's privacy policy. So we have several goals for our system. Uh, first, we uh, do not want to share proprietary server-side code. So we support this through a check that is plugged into the build pipeline of the website. Uh, this setup effectively complements existing test testing benchmarks at Consumer Reports, which uh, glean data processing practices uh, of the organization from publicly accessible information, such as uh, through traffic analysis. Uh, second, uh, server-side platforms and machines may be buggy. We only require users to trust uh, a small hardware platform within the OS to be free of vulnerabilities instead of the entire machines. Uh, for our prototype, this is the Intel SGX platform. In this sense, we move away from solutions such as SEALs that simply audit the software and trust the OS to be uh, free of bugs. Uh, third, users should be able to know how their data is actually being processed by websites. So uh, by itself, the user facing part of our product can also be used to just uh, show how privacy friendly a privacy policy is. And uh, finally, we want to help the organization have compliant policies and code. So for instance, uh, if it refines the privacy policy from A to B, but does not make the appropriate changes in the code, uh, then our product should be able to catch this and alert developers to fix the code to reflect uh, version B of the privacy policy. Uh, so we develop a system that includes both uh, server-side and client-side components to ultimately ensure that users' data is handled in compliance with the privacy policy. Uh, at the heart of our product, uh, we run a verifier on the server-side platform that takes as input the website source code and the privacy policy. It compares the two for compliance. This is essentially the part of our system uh, that I mentioned earlier uh, that plugs in into the organization's built pipeline. Uh, apart from the verifier, we also run a few other programs on the server-side platform, which are shown in red here. And of course, there's the website itself, and then we have a decryptor program. Beforehand, the client indirectly authenticates the decryptor and that the website has been checked by a valid verifier. Uh, once the user fills out a form, uh, the client forwards its uh, personally identified information in encrypted form to the decryptor and uh, it passes through the website and the decryptor only hands over plain text uh, PII to a, tar uh, to a target website that has been uh, you know, verified by the, uh, by the verifier to be compliant. Uh, all of these programs run within uh, the Intel SGX platform uh, within the OS, so we don't need to trust that uh, the entirety of the OS is free of bugs, and we're going to focus on the client's uh, browser extension. Here we want to show a positive signal to the user when the code and policies are compliant, and uh, we want to address the case when both the privacy policy and code are compliant, like in the example here, uh, but both are sort of, you know, really privacy invasive because uh, your data is being shared with uh, third parties. So uh, let's go through the steps and take a deep dive. Um, so as to how we build um, a privacy score out of a privacy policy model. Uh, we obtain a privacy policy model of a site uh, using existing tools. Um, so it starts with the privacy policy, generates the model. Uh, the tool that we use is policies. We look at data collection and uh, sharing practices. These are the ones that we can currently verify. Um, and so we arrive at a model uh, like this, where for each information type, so here we have financial data and contact data, uh, we know why and how it's uh, being collected. And uh, we also know who it's being shared with uh, and why. So uh, for each field, uh, for example, the information type uh, and the purpose of use, uh, we uh, assign um, the value 
of the field uh, with the score, depending on the sensitivity. So uh, perhaps sharing your health uh, data is more sensitive than uh, just sharing uh, how you're interacting with the website or your uh, mouse traces. And uh, not sharing items uh, gives, uh, gives uh, an information type a better score than sharing items and not collecting an information type at all, uh, you know, gives that, that, that gets even an even better score. And so finally, for each information type, we have a final score that is uh, made up of weighted scores of all these different fields, such as the purpose of use, how it's collected and shared. And uh, so here uh, in this example, um, we have three different types and of information, uh, three different information types. And uh, this is for a financial website. And so a financial website, website collecting health data is, is a little uh, fishy. And so we have that a low score. Uh, and again, the source go from low to high, from zero to 100. And uh, each of them is, is assigned into a category. So health gets into a red category because it's kind of scary. Uh, contact information is being shared. So it's a little sketchy, uh, but you know, a financial website collecting financial information kind of makes sense, so it's it's green. Um, and uh, just to give a demo of our our system here, um, we have uh, for myfavoritebank.com we have six different information types that are being collected, as you can see. And uh, let's focus on the red one, health, because that's a little scary. Um, and here we can see that uh, it was actually uh, collected from a third party and it was to provide some additional service that that financial site or that bank provides. And uh, even though the data is not being shared, mitigators still gave it a low score because it's kind of unexpected to uh, use health data for a financial site. And for the contact information type, we see that it, it is being shared with the third party for a given purpose and uh, mitigator gave it an intermediate score. Um, of, of 45 to this practice. Uh, and uh, since it was, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of uh, not, not, not too bad. And then uh, here for location data, it's in blue because um, you know, your, your bank does not collect your location data at all. So uh, that's great. And Mitigator gave it a score of 100. Um, uh, for our next steps, uh, we hope to improve this extension and also work with CR on more of the server-side components. Uh, specifically, we would like to refine the verifier component to check uh, different data processing practices for a simple website's, uh, website's backend. Uh, we would also like to implement an authentication services to basically offload some of the authentication work that each user's um, extension would have to do uh, otherwise. And that concludes my presentation, and I would like to, uh, I would be happy to take any questions that you may have. Great job. Thank you so much, MIDI Team Mitigator. What you have created is incredibly powerful and incredibly cool. So um, this is really incredible work. Let's open it up. Um, Jim, CR team attendees, please feel free to use, uh, jump in, um, mm -hmm. share thoughts, Q&A feedback. Yeah, I, I guess I could kick off uh, just by saying that um, this is really looking at like a, a core computer science problem. So. The, the way that it's relevant to CR is there's lots of products and services that we'd like to be able to evaluate that we'll never be able to, either because we don't have the source code or because there's things running on the server side that we'll never be able to access. And this is a proof of concept for how we could set up um, a zero knowledge service where you know we could have relatively high confidence that something is following the digital standard or respecting you know, user data the way that we'd like to see, uh, but without actually having inspected the code ourselves. So conceptually and from like a computer science perspective, it's so fascinating. Uh, and what I like about the way that you guys have thought about this, Minty and Ian, is that uh, if we can find the right demonstration, if we can find the right use case, we may be able to help advance the state of the art uh, and bring you know, manufacturers to the table in a way that will be necessary for something like this to work. So it's true that this does really require um, you know, active participation, buy-in, you know, from the companies um, that would be audited, so to speak. And I think that that's an area where we may be able to help over time. And so I'm really excited to continue digging in on this, find the right digital standard case study uh, and see where we might be able to, to show the, the potential of this. Yeah, 100%, we would love to do that, mm -hmm. I think. All right, any other thoughts, feedback? I just want to give the oh go for it, Ted. 
Oh, thanks. I just want to give uh, Mitty and the team a big shout out. Like it's one thing for like, you know, kind of websites to talk the talk and those privacy policies are kind of completely not transparent, but then to kind of see if they're walking the walk in a coded way that's really um, transparent to users is a powerful concept and I'm excited to see how this develops. We're seeing some positive feedback. Mm, thanks uh, in for the that, chat. Ted. Yeah. Thank you, Ted. Also seeing some positive feedback in the chat here. All right, we're actually sort of running a little bit behind on time, so we're going to have to jump to the next team. Uh, but please continue to give feedback and thoughts in our chat. Um, all right, let's go to uh, Team Thinkscope. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Achit, and uh, we are Project Thinkscope. Together with Artyom, I would be uh, both of us would be presenting today, and. Apart from us, Aman, Gaston, and Henning are also part of this team. And together we represent the Internet Real-Time Lab at Columbia University. So before I get into the presentation, there is an important question that I want to raise that I want us to think about. How many of us are actually aware what these internet-connected devices that are all around us are actually doing in the background? And when I say background, what I mean is what data are they collecting? Who are they talking to? Who are they sending this data to? And so on. And there have already been concerns about these Internet of Things or IoT devices eavesdropping on our activities. And this eavesdropping could be um, safe and uh, innocent, but it could also be intentional and malicious. And so the purpose of our project is to focus on the privacy concerns with these IoT devices that are, although inexpensive, but are actually powerful computers connected to the Internet. So let's take a look at a typical IoT environment in a smart home, right? On the, on the right, you have your smart products like your smart camera, smart speaker that connect through your home router to the internet. Uh, and over the internet, they would talk to, they would send messages to some server. Uh, one, one example could be a remote controller application, which connects your mobile application to these devices so that you can control them from anywhere around the world as long as you're connected to the internet. So here's where our project comes in. What we have developed is an instrument that examines the behavior, the network behavior of an IoT device, and we call it Project ThingScope. So we divide it into two parts. Uh, the first part is a tool that can analyze the network behavior of an IoT device. So this means, like I said before, what server it's talking to, um, how many messages it is sending, what protocol uh, are these messages using, and things like that. And once we have data on multiple devices, we generate a lot of data and we store them in uh, a cloud-based database, which is the second part of our project. And this database is used to provide information to two users uh, through, the, through a website or a browser extension. So our network setup kind of looks like this. Uh, we have the same smart home environment in the background, but now in the middle, we have uh, our tool, our system, which makes sure that every message that goes out from this device to the internet goes through our system. And our tool will analyze these messages and send relevant information to our database that I spoke about. So this database, um, although has currently few devices that we've tested on, but is designed to be scalable uh, so that it can uh, store information for billions of IoT devices over time. And this information can be crowdsourced from different projects that are working on uh, a similar um, similar idea. So I've gone over the technical details um, about collecting information and storing it. I'd, I'd like to show a demo so that you have a better understanding of our project. So right now what I have, if everybody can see this, is a smart camera uh, manufactured by WISE. And I hope you can see this screen as well. So I'm gonna connect this and the camera is booting up. And while it's doing that, I'm going to talk about our script. So I'm going to start running it so it waits for the device to boot up. But essentially what the script is going to do is um, try to look for the IoT device, the smart camera, and uh, in the network. And once it detects that, it'll, it'll display that. And then it'll slowly start displaying the names of the different servers that this device sends messages to. Uh, as you can see, it has detected the device and you see the different server names. So like I said, the manufacturer is a WISE cam. WISE is the manufacturer. So we expect the WISE server, but you also see some Amazon servers, which are probably uh, the remote controller application that I spoke about earlier. 
that connects your mobile app to these devices. And so all of this data is stored in our database and updated at regular intervals, which Artyom will talk about more. Thank you, Archit. Hi, everyone. Here is our uh, website where we present the database in a very user-friendly way. As you can see, there are a list of the devices you already detected. And if you click one of them, you get more information like the device name, model, manufacturer, network data, privacy policy, and so on. We, we also provide a special search mechanism where you can search the information in our database. And um, I would like to mention what the current website is a uh, public and you can check it out right now. We do also provide the browser, special browser extension. So for example, if you go to the visa.com website, check out our browser extension and, and it says, okay, we found uh, this kind of the device in our database, please check it out. And if you click, it directly redirects to the website. We do also provide the special APIs where type parties can get access of the information we do store in a database, like uh, Bam Bam team already mentioned. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Artyom. Um, and so for our final uh, slide, I would like to summarize the project and talk about next steps. So what we have built uh, is a system that can capture the network behavior of an IoT device uh, and help us visualize um, the information that is being exchanged to give us more knowledge than what an average user knows. So this tool can crowdsource the network activity of different IoT devices and um, build it into a database over time. And finally, use that information to present it in a user-friendly way to the user through the, web browser, through the browser extension or the website API and uh, things like that. And for next steps, um, further development of the tool can definitely be done to add more capabilities. Some capabilities that we think are interesting are like looking into encrypted traffic to see what data is being exchanged, uh, coming up with a privacy rating system based on the data that we've collected uh, and some more information to come up to rate these IoT devices based on their privacy and definitely testing more and more IoT devices. Finally, what we have built is a way to give consumers uh, better guidance into choosing their next IoT product wisely. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Team Thinkscope. Good job. All right, let's open it up to uh, feedback and Q and A. I'll just say from my side that that was super exciting. Uh, as I, I said to you guys uh, throughout this semester, I, I love the live demo. I love that it, you know it's amazing to see that work in, in real time, and and I think exciting to see the capabilities there. So I think there's a lot of opportunity behind this this technology, and and it's, it's exciting to see it rolled out. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, and yep. I mean so much overlap in terms of what we could do together. Um, similar to the um, the BAM group, you know, we have a, a business process where we bring in lots of smart products and do a controlled environment, sort of tested them. And so, you know, if we could try to contribute to a shared database, try to understand those endpoints, I think that has a lot of value for you know making evaluations. You know, are some devices more chatty than they need to be? If you compare all the smart TVs, are some of them more leaky than you want them to be? Um, but also I can imagine lots of other applications. And I think we talked about this too. Um, this could be the basis of like um, ad blocking for hardware, you know, for lack of a better term. Um, if uh, a device is communicating with a lot of maybe advertising endpoints that are not necessary for the operation of the device, you can imagine suppressing those connections and you know maybe there'd be some value or something like that running on the router. Um, so super exciting. and. Um, as usual, you know, I think we're really excited to follow up and figure out what we can do uh, to collaborate, to support you in building the database and everything in between. Thank you, definitely we are open for collaboration and uh, all the futures you mentioned, it is definitely possible to do. This is exactly what we wanna hear and what we wanna see. All right, we have one question from um, Anoop. Would this analysis still work when traffic is on uh, a router VPN? Who wants to answer that from the team? Yeah, I can, I can speak to that. Um, we gather the data locally. So unless the device itself establishes a VPN to kind of its uh, kind of 
uh, its manufacturer or vendor, uh, we would still see the traffic since it's really local within the, uh, the home network. And as far as I know, most devices don't do their own VPNs. They directly talk through the, uh, the gateway. So anything that the gateway can, home gateway can see, uh, we can see. Great, we, yeah, we actually just to add to the chat is we have a separate project. Um, so to add to the chat, separate chat question is we have a, a sister project that does exactly what is described namely preventing DDoS attacks uh, on that. So that actually motivated uh, the original design and we do intend to see those as being kind of uh, things that in practice should be combined in the same infrastructure in that. So we have a, uh, we're using some of manufacturer usage descriptions to characterize the devices in the normal behavior. Great, thank you so much. Uh, great work, team Thingscope. Any other thoughts, questions? If not, we will move on to the next team. All right. We are now gonna take a bit of a pivot and dive into, um, go back in time and, and shift gears a little bit. We're gonna jump into uh, Ganesha's terms. So, uh, all right, can Alia? you see my screen? Yep, we see your screen. Great, thank you, let me present. Hi everyone, thanks for taking the time to be here. My name is Alina and I'm here to tell you about Ganesha's Terms, which is an interactive narrative about um, data economies to be played on browsers. This is our team. We're game makers and designers from the Game Center at NYU and Parsons. Uh, together, we've created Ganesha's Terms to be a card-based allegory about privacy and consent for the everyday online user. Before we share with you this experience and what it looks like, I'll give you a little bit of context. Uh, take a step back and imagine data. That's really hard, actually. Um, what happens to our information online, as we've been seeing, is very difficult to access. And what the, what's on either side of terms and services is even more of a challenge to know. Um, definitely, terms and services designed as legal protection for large companies, rather than the end user in mind, doesn't help. Also, the fact that a large economy branching out from the tiny pieces of our data uh, is easier to represent in math and statistics, um, makes it fine for a computing interface and harder for us. On the other hand, uh, the creation myth of Ganesha happens to involve a misinterpretation and privacy breach and has been around for a really long time. It's got clear actors and uh, huge consequences that people can remember, which makes for a great analogy to talk about data and consent in broad strokes or detail, which I'll get to in a minute. As I said, it's been around for a while. In numbers, um, with 560 million users, India happens to be the second largest online market today. That's a lot of people who can relate to this story and it's also uh, great to improve representation uh, of our media to the people that are part of it. Finally, card games, another really effective form to deal with vast economies and individual units. All of these are fantastic uh, forms to internalize complex hierarchies that have been adapted and retold for a long time. This makes them the longest living forms of inter information technologies. So let's get into the meat of the story um, and how it applies to uh, data applications. It starts really intimate in the middle of a goddess's bathwater. Once upon a time in the Himalayas, Parvati wanted some alone tech. She's stepping into her bath at which point her husband uh, Shiva walks in totally unannounced. Uh, Parvati is angry. She figures it's time that she has her own guardian to protect her privacy. That's when she creates um, Ganesha uh, from the turmeric pace of her bath. At this point, he has a human head, uh, but it's going to go south. Let's look at how this parallel might happen on a really basic level in our card sets uh, with data. Uh, the home of the gods, Mount Kailash, is an ex existential area of contention for the couple. Uh, for the goddess, it's an extension of her being. From the perspective of her husband, Shiva, it's a space of his domain unquestioned. Uh, these are two perspectives and interpretations of one unit, Mount Kailash data. 
from the story of a guardian uh, child born of a privacy violation, this was a great space to start. Um, I'll pass now uh, over to Varun, who'll give you an example of how a user might interact with this in our demo. Varun, take it away. Uh, hi, yeah, so currently we have a prototype that features the first two chapters of the story. And uh, we've tested this out with a few outside play testers from our average online user demographic. And uh, this footage has been sped up a bit to demo several aspects. Uh, but what you can see here is how players go about choosing cards based on partial sentences that they're given on the screen. And uh, what they'll be doing is that they'll be clicking, selecting cards from this ring on the left to create a hand on the right. And then they click through this hand to find the correct order to fill up the blanks in the given sentence of the myth story. This will then reward them with a parallel of the myth in a data use case. If they choose an incorrect card, they receive negative feedback where the card flips over, informing them that their selection is wrong. And we also have a zooming in feature, which helps to look at enlarged versions of the card. Cards, uh, a clear button is also there on the top right corner, which allows players to clear out their hand at any moment to be able to start over if they made the wrong selections. And once players have com complete one chapter set of sentences, they'll be proceeding ahead to the next one in which they'll repeat this process with increasing complex complexity of sentences and use cases of data conflicts. And uh, yeah, now uh, Jason will get into the research that was involved. Jason, you're on mute. Building this prototype involved an exploration into both technical implementations and narrative analysis of both mythical and digital worlds. These are not naturally aligned topics. One is several millennia old and the other is barely 50 years old. Paradoxically, this might be why it makes for a good fit in creating an analogy space for the story. To draw the analogies between those two worlds, we need to research the narrative of the data that we were actually producing. How did it move and how did it get acted upon? We researched several analyses of data economies, Crack Labs Networks of Control is of particular note for this, uh, in their articulation of the types of actions and actors that exist in the information economy. It's a comprehensive breakdown of specifically the exchanges and types of data that get used by corporations. With clear actors, we set about picking out common phrases and expressions that showed up in the data and mythic stories. We combined myth verbs like prayer, follows, orders, with data verbs like uses, access, and permits, and as well as matched characters. We made the relationships that sort of made sense to us. We used these then to create cards that would be in the game. These would have the characters' names as well as their corresponding representation in our data world. Here you can see some of the art and the division between the verbs and characters. And with the cards metaphorically in hand, we started to create the actual sentences that certain configurations of cards would link to. For this exercise and prototype, we mostly wanted to test our card technical system. We have sentences that can be organized and written together as matching sets. These are things that you see in the prototype itself. We have available sentences of varying complexities, from card needing only a card pair to needing something resembling more like a poker hand, something like five cards. A major key here was the ability to author these sentences smoothly for game creation. And with the smooth development and prototyping pipeline, it helps us work towards creating this sort of escalation. Our users are able to discover how the story itself builds. By using the, and interacting with the cards, our audience can find the reoccurring characters and actors within both of these narratives. They can find through the cards which parties are responsible for which types of action. They journey through the conflict escalation, and our audience will see how actors in both myth and data stories repeat and change through that overlapping space. That overlap becomes the analogies that they can discover through playing with the toy, and then the knowledge that we provide them through those relationships is what they keep with them. So our next steps, uh, they're twofold. First, it's integrating this full range of examples that Jason was talking about from small to large scale, uh, scale into our structure. There are examples like uh, Uber using location data to change the price of your ride, or India's national fight with Facebook's free basics over net neutrality. Beyond that, it's also ensuring that we have this uh, book feature here to store the individual sentences of the myth and data stories face to face, <clears throat> which helps users step back from the details while they're playing and internalize the connections and parallels as they play across the three chapters as uh, the epic drama unfolds. Um, our card game narrative finishes with a question. In the myth, the story ends surprisingly well, sure. Shiva beheads the child Ganesha in his rage, 
at being locked out of his house. And yes, his wife Parvati does threaten to destroy all creation. But then the god Brahma guides the couple to a compromise. Ganesha is reborn as a higher being with an elephant head uh, to replace the old one and the family here reunites. In our real world, we're not really there. We're in the midst of the privacy wars. We haven't found the elephant head or the guide to remove our problems yet. Uh, the good news is that uh, we're getting a better understanding that consent and control are not a moment and a process and that much of this struggle isn't new. Many sides are working on it. What can we all get out of this? Using cards and stories can help us assemble and keep track of complicated systems. They can also be a tool to start imagining solutions differently. Technologies from thousands of years ago and today can be merged. The more perspectives are involved in the search, the more we can try. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Team Ganesha. Ganesha's terms. All right, let's open it up to um, feedback, uh, thoughts, questions. Your project is so meta. There are moments where I'm like, oh, and it's like fascinating. I guess I, I have one question. Do you anticipate that you can play, can a user play or interact with the with the game multiple times for different outcomes? Is this, is there, is there, or is this kind of a, a one-time use um, engagement? Right now, the way we've imagined it is a one-time use given the con the amount of content that we have. But with larger resources, we would we would expand the chapters and be like, as myth, you start and you have an overarching idea that I, I talked about, but there's so many different individual scenes that can happen. And a lot of these uh, misinterpretations and abuses can be mapped to different uh, scenarios. And so with a larger, uh, a larger set of resources and time, we would actually start by having these three chapters and be like, okay, let's focus in on the first one and apply that to a different policy or to a different uh, um, new kind of protection that's going on um, on individual levels or on large levels, depending, depending on the content. But the translation takes a while. So it's um, conceptually, it's possible. Um, practically, it, it would take a uh, longer time. Got it, thanks. Ben, were you gonna say something? Um, I was gonna say that um, people who work in privacy are aware that dramatizing it and making it you know, interesting and emotionally resonant for regular people is one of the hardest things to do. And I love the creativity here, especially for people who are aware of the story of Ganesha. Um, I love also, uh, I don't think I've thought about privacy and computers as having the potential to destroy all creation. Uh, but you know, it's it's really interesting to see where you guys have taken it, and um, the the design itself is very beautiful. Um, so I just want to call that out. I mean, I, I love the look and feel of what you've done, and I'm really curious to see what the user testing will reveal as you continue to build. Yeah. All right, we've got a question. We've got some great feedback uh, in the chat. Uh, thank you, Anoop and Ginny. We also have a question from Michael. What tech stack libraries were used for the presentation layer, storing the user's outcomes, et cetera. Jason, do you want to talk about that? Yes. Uh, the We actually just made our own little data structure for it um, just as an object. So we think of this as sort of like a, a concept first sort of universe. So the, the puzzle is thought of as the unit that you have to sort of dissect. So cards themselves have identities that exist as both mythical and data references and that you can use those as keys to, to fit into whatever puzzles you see. Um, and then the puzzle itself determines what keys of what a type of cards you have, the pair or the three of a kind or something similar, then unlock the type of information that's inside of it, whether that be the mythical story or the data piece that we've kind of associated together. Uh, this kind of feeds into Jim's question about if it is just a one-time thing or something that you can do several times, uh, it's completely feasible that at some point, if you had a lot of these, you can start to say, okay, here's actually what all of these card things together should form as a sentence if you were to put them together. Uh, just for the sake of where we were at, it made sense to tackle it this way first, because this is sort of like the first step to figuring out, hey, what type of stories would I be assembling hypothetically as like a counterfactual if I were to just take this random assortment of cards, this grab bag of cards, and put them together, and what sentences would I get, what ideas would form. Yeah, so I guess also specifically for the presentation layer, this was something that we made in Unity, uh, the game the game engine. 
Awesome, thank you. Oh, seeing a note uh, from Bill as well. Um, great, thank you. With that, any other questions, feedback, and we will, nope. All right, let's thank you very much, Team Ganesha's Terms, great work. Let's move on to our final team presentation, uh, data control. Last but not least. All right, we see your screen. All right, hello. We are Data Control and we are excited to be speaking to you today. We are Marianne, Sohi, Bavia, Jason, who's on two teams, um, and Rosa. We are all second year master students at Parsons in the design and technology program. And our work covers a variety of interest areas from machine learning and 3D modeling to game theory and community building. But what unites us is our desire to create and utilize technology that is equitable, responsible, and transparent. When you visit a website for the first time, you'll probably see a notice like this. It's the entry point for many websites. You're asked how you want your privacy respected, if you agree to certain cookies, if you wanna make sure the website is usable, whatever that means. But usually the language in these notices is vague and confusing to read, especially if you're not well versed in data usage policies. And even if you do decide to change the default preferences, you're faced with even more complexity. Privacy policies are long, detailed, and usually not written in plain language. And every company has their own version of a policy, so you have to opt out at every individual website. Each site has different language about the preferences you're selecting. So even if you take the time to understand and select your desired privacy settings, it's challenging to know the consequences of opting in or out. Simply put, this is not a user-friendly experience for anyone but the company. So we wanted to understand how people felt about this process. So we surveyed a number of people within our academic cohort and our cohort is primarily composed of people in the 28 to 35 year old that make up about 75% of all the people that we surveyed. And in general, as critical technologists, we tend to trend negatively against corporate powers. Uh, in our data, we track mean and mode responses on a scale of one to five, where one is a strong disagreement and five is a strong agreement. And we took mode to determine how choice may have, may have been trending. Even among our skeptical cohort, we had a diversity of responses. Uh, these are just some of the ones that we wanted to highlight. There are places where people believe that data use is good and beneficial to them and places where they definitely reject it, but it's not a totally consistent response. The current model of accepting and declining wholesale is not really able to get at this level of complexity. And what's more, we found a gap between what people wanted control over and what was being provided by companies. There needed to be some sort of dialogue between user and service to clarify what happens to that data. But you can't have a conversation with a contract. This is data control an online educational tool and chatbot to help users connect with the consequences of their data choices and have a single location to control their data outcomes across multiple websites. Over the course of a short dialogue, you could ask about the different components of a privacy policy and specify exactly what settings you want. Our team wanted to focus on the flow of the experience. We designed a more welcoming conversation to introduce audiences to the concepts of information, privacy, and what it means to accept the term. Instead of building the chatbot, we spent our time on user research, content design, and art direction. Our chatbot DC would ask the user the comfort levels with different privacy settings and explain what changing them would mean. In this example, the user isn't sure how to answer a question, so they ask for more information. DC provides them with a longer explanation about what that specific privacy choice might mean for them and how that might differ from the company's own intent. The website would also provide some introductory information about how privacy policies are set up and how companies use your data. For example, the three types of information you create every time you go online and the three things that businesses can use your information for profit. This intro would be an entry point for users who aren't familiar with the typical ways companies use their data. Um, our hope for the future would be to build the backend of this 
product and figure out how to connect it to a third party website um, so that the users can actually seamlessly update their preferences. Um, there are also potential policy ramification of building a tool like this. For example, if people could see how their preferences aligned or did not align with certain companies, how would they choose to engage with those companies and how would it cause companies to adjust their practices? And we're very excited about all the potential uses for this kind of work. Thank you so much for your time and we look forward to your feedback. All right, great job, team data control, great work. All right, let's open it up to uh, feedback questions. Hey guys, um, it's really clever. Um, are you thinking that this could be both a way to like um, conversationally assess a privacy policy as well as maybe a way of giving your permission in the future? Go ahead, Jason. Yeah. I think it's both. Uh, one of the key aspects of this is that it, we wanted to envision it as a single place of service, essentially, one that you could both see updates in terms of what types of things are being collected and have your opinion be collected on that. And also as a way of uh, one of our future and really big goals, I think conceptually for this is to say, okay, if you feel this way, have that be distilled into a, uh, into a, a set of answers that you can provide to a company to say, hey, this is how you should treat me on the web uh, and have that be a durable thing that you have in one location as opposed to stored separately across however many websites that I've just used today. Uh, especially because like, I think the very basic complaint is if I wanted to update that policy right now on say the Guardian's website, I literally do not know where to find that. I'm, I'm thinking um, it's two kind of, ambitious and very interesting projects, right? Um, the idea of using it to set permissions, uh, it might be interesting to find a partner, you know, who's ideologically inclined and, you know, who's got the capacity to help you do a, a demonstration case. Um, so I think that would like take a, a certain pathway um, on, on the kind of like, let's figure out which policies are in line with your values. One idea would be um, uh, Princeton uh, has a, uh, a project at the Center for um, Information Technology Policy called the Princeton Leuven Longitudinal Corpus of Privacy Policies. Uh, and it's pretty wild. They've been scraping, I think, hundreds of thousands of websites, collecting their privacy policies uh, and making them available for analysis. And they kind of pull out some key aspects. So it could be that working with a data set like that, you could quickly develop you know, a, a case study prototype kind of thing where you, you could kind of make it work on real life websites and you know maybe someone could even pick the website to conversationally interrogate. Um, so I'm just gonna drop the link in here in case that's interesting to you. And uh, we work closely with this group uh, in case you would like a connection and maybe to exchange ideas with them. Um, I think that that might be the right way to go before bringing it to a partner because then you'll be able to demo the technology and kind of give a user centric demo. Uh, so if we can help you in that way or in any other way, just uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Great idea and really exciting work. Um, seeing some great feedback from Selena. So thank you. Yeah, I think this chatbot feature is super, I think it's a great way to really gain feedback, gain insights. And I think this idea of pulling in, you know, and scaling this using data sets like the one that Ben just shared is a great next step. Um, Ted, thank you, Ted. Thank you, Grant. And some positive feedback here. All right, we're actually exactly at time now, which is incredible because we just had 16 presentations um, all within about an hour. So this has been, um, Let's see, let's open it up to any other thoughts, feedback and questions from our audience about all of our teams and our challenge. Um, we'll take a moment and give folks the opportunity to provide feedback however they'd like. Um, otherwise, 
cohort, let's take a moment and open up all our videos because this concludes our challenge demo day. It has been an incredible journey with all of you. We are all so proud of all the work that you've done to get to uh, our presentations today. Um, thank you all so much for your hard work and would love to just call out the CR team without whom these teams would not have gotten to where they are today. They have provided feedback, guidance, and mentorship every step along the way. So thank you very much. Jim, Bed, uh, Ted, Grant, Bill, um, and I hope I'm not missing anyone, <laughs> but um, thank you all so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. amazing work. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I just wanna, thank you. I just wanna take a moment, Erica, to appreciate you um, and the coordination that you did to convene this great, like this amazing and talented group of students and faculty, the passion and dedication that this group has brought to this effort is really tremendous and inspiring for Consumer Reports. I've been talking to folks inside the building um, about like, you know, kind of, our, I chair the New Venture Steering Team and um, like, I'm so excited about this work. It's just so inspirational. And I wanna thank everyone for their like, you know, time, care and attention that you put into the projects. Like great work, great things are coming. I also wanna recognize um, Jim and, and Ben and Bill and Grant for, for being here with us, but, but thank you, thank you, thank you. Really great work. I'm thrilled to be working with you, so inspiring. I love these, I was like, wow, how are we gonna do this? These meetings are so much fun. It's such good work, thank you. Thank you so much, it's our pleasure. Thank you.